Rory with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. This meeting today uh, is being held at, under the governor's executive order 16 regarding electronic meetings. The items on the meeting agenda constitute essential business of this body and meeting electronically is necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and outbreak. Is, is there a motion to approve that electronic meeting notice, please? Mr. Woods, I move to approve. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor, Karen Robbins. Aye. Dora Kern. Aye. Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Feller Brown. Betsy Williams. Aye. Okay. The motion has been approved. I move for approval of the agenda of today's meeting. I'll move to move to approve, Commissioner Kern. That's Commissioner Kern. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Woods. Okay. All in favor? Karen Robbins. Aye. Nora Kern. Aye. Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Feller Brown. Betsy Williams. Aye. The agenda's been approved. I'm <laughs> Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember O'Connell. I'm also here and would be an eye on that one. All right, thank you, council member. Okay. Uh, move for approval of the minutes of the November 9th meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Move to approve, Commissioner Woods. All right, is there a second, please? Second, this is Nora. Nora, thank you, Ms. Kern. Uh, all in favor, Karen Robbins. Aye. Nora Kern. Aye. Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Feller Brown. Betsy Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Freddie O'Connell. Okay. Thank you. The minutes have been approved. Um, approval of the consent agenda. Um, Please note that items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Knopf, I think you said there were maybe gonna be some items uh, to remove. Yes, and, and while I've got your attention, Mr. Chair, um, we do have officer Lloyd with us. Um, so when you're going through the votes, he's representing. Oh, okay. Th okay. Thank you for correcting my oversight. Appreciate that. Um, at the request of Councilman Sledge, he would like to remove item D under the consent agenda. Just remove it from consent. Okay. And then um, item I at the request of Council Lady Murphy. Okay. All right. Okay. Are there any other items that people want to consider separately? Uh, Commissioner Green, um, this is Commissioner Kern. I would like to discuss items B and C as well. B and C. Okay. All right. All right. Any other comments? All right. If someone would make a motion to remove item D and I for deferral. 
So moved. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that, John. Okay. All right. Karen Robbins on the motion Aye. to remove D and I. Okay. Aye. Nora Kern. <laughs> Sorry, I. Sorry. Uh, Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Feller Brown. Betsy Williams. Aye. Freddie O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. He's still there? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm sorry. Aye. Okay, thank you. Okay, that removes item D and I. Miss. Kern, would you like a motion to remove item B and C? Yes, I will make a motion to move items B and C for discussion. Okay. All right. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner Woods. Okay. All in favor, Karen Robbins? Aye. Nora Kern? Aye. Bella Brown? Sarah Lee Woods? Aye. Betsy Williams? Aye. Freddie O'Connell? Aye. Officer Loy? Aye. Okay. All right. So I'm going to read the consent agenda has been modified for approval. Item A, mandatory referral 2020M016AB001, a request, a request for the abandonment of a right-of-way and easement along a portion of Alley 2004 from Baptist World Center Drive northeastward to Alley 2003, requested by Jenner Design. Item E, mand mandatory referral 2020M20AB001, a request to abandon Alley's number 1171 Seven eight and two o two near Madison Street. Utilities are to abandon to be abandoned and relocated. Request by Barge Coffin and Associates. Item F. Man referral two zero two zero m two one a b zero zero one. A request to abandon Day Street from West Trinity Lane to five hundred and sixty feet west of Trinity Lane. Requested by Dell and Associates. Item G, authorize an all-way stop at Edwin Street and a street to be named approximately 350 feet south of East Trinity Lane requested by EOA Architects. Item H, authorize an all-way stop at Wood Street and 4th Street requested by Council Member Hager. And item J, authorize no parking on the east side of 19th Avenue South from the intersection with Division Street to 100 feet along 19th Avenue South. No parking on both sides of 19th Avenue South from the intersection with Division Street to 100 feet south along 19th Avenue South, requested by KCI Technologies. That is the consent agenda has been read. Is there a motion to approve? So moved, Commissioner Kern. Thank you, Ms. Kern. Is there a second? Second by, second by O'Connell. Okay, thank you. All in favor, Karen Robbins. Aye. Nora Kern. Aye. Sarah Lee Woods. Aye. Feller Brown. Betsy Williams. Aye. Freddie O'Connell. Aye. And Officer Loy. Aye. The consent agenda has been approved. Um, item B and C, Ms. Kern, you had requested those items be removed for further discussion. <laughs> item B is mandatory referral 2020M. 17AB001, a request for the abandonment of right-of-way on portions of Alley 434 
428 and 628 near Caldwell Avenue. Utility easements be retained requested by Catalyst Design Group applicant. And item C is a mandatory referral 2020M18AB001, a request for the abandonment of right of way along White Oak Lane from Hillsboro Pike to White Oak Drive. Utility easements be retained requested by Lasanti Enterprises LLC. Uh, yes, on the first one on Caldwell Avenue, I was mostly concerned about where it was. I saw there were some active alleys. I couldn't quite tell from the map. So it's 15th. Um, so yeah, could staff just clarify where that is? Okay. Uh, I, Mr. Walters from Catalyst Group, I think you're on the call. Andrew? Yes. Hello, Commissioner Green. Hello, Commissioners. I'm, I'm happy to try to answer that question for Ms. Byrne. Um, this is located in between the blocks of uh, 12th and 15th Avenues along Caldwell. You can sort of see there that it's a, it's a really a loop alley system. Uh, Belmont University actually owns every one of these parcels except for uh, there's a, a track on the, on the western edge. It's, um, it's got a one in it right now, right next to the 48. That parcel is actually owned by MDHA. And then lot number 53 in that southwestern corner is not owned by Belmont. They have agreements with those neighbors to essentially privatize that, that alley uh, and, and maintain it for trash and service. And um, the abandonment of this allows some connectivity to the south, to the hillside apartments as part of a new dormitory project that's planning right now. Okay, I think that answered my question. It looked active, so so it will continue to be maintained, but just by Belmont privately. Is that right? Yes, that's right. It will be, it will be maintained as a private access corridor for trash and service uh, vehicles and also fire uh, for that adjacent to the crowd. Got it. Okay, thank you. That clears up my confusion. I'll um, move to work. Work. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Item, for service. Yep. item C, Ms. Kern. And this one, I was just curious um, why it was being abandoned. Because, um, yeah, that was my question. Seems a little different than the other ones. Mr. Knopf, can you answer this? I, I can't see our participant okay. list. Do we have a representative from Lasante on the call, on the meeting list? And if not, Mr. Doyle can help us out. What to say? Hello. Hello. May I please speak, Mike Mogdi? Uh, yes, sir. Please go ahead. All the neighbors want to abandon this road. It has been never used. There is a lot of vegetable and wild animals, if you will, that, that we see there, that are dangerous to pets. And if the road ever builds, the crime in our area will go up. So all the neighbors have voted to request you to abandon it. Another thing, it will increase the traffic flow so much that the people who are riding, walking with the kids will be unsafe or somewhat dangerous. So these are some of the few things that road never existed and just occupying the vegetables trees, growing wild grass that does not fit in with the neighborhood we live in. Thank you. Uh, I, was there a road plans for this um, right of way or 
No, it, it's never been planned. The road is a lot of grass and trees are growing on that road. So all the 52 members who are neighbors to that road and also neighbors to another road adjacent to it have unanimously requested you to consider our request. Thank you. Yeah, that clarifies. I was just a little confused um, why now, but I think um, that answers a lot of my questions. So I'll move to approve both items. Um, uh, all right, but there's a motion to approve item B and C. Is there a second? Uh, second. This is Commissioner okay. Woods. Thank you, Ms. Woods. All right, we'll do the roll call. Karen Robbins? Aye. Nora Kern? Aye. Sarah Lee Woods? Aye. Feller Brown? Betsy Williams? Aye. Freddie O'Connell? Aye. Officer Loy? Uh, okay. The motion's been approved. Thank you, everyone. Okay. The next item on the agenda is adoption of a proposed valet fee policy. Uh, Mr. Hammond from Metro Public Works is here to discuss, and I think there's several people on the call who would like to make comments as well. Mr. Mr. Chair. Hammond. Mr. Chair, uh, yes. I'm sorry if I missed this. Did we did we take an official motion on item I for Council Lady Murphy? I thought we voted to remove those. The first we, they we, was voted to yeah, uh, uh, D and I. They were yes. voted to be removed and deferred. Sledge and Murphy items were deferred. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Mr. Hammond. Before I get started, can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioners. I appreciate the time to uh, be here to speak on this on, on what is a very busy day for you. So I will, I will step through the high points of the proposed uh, policy change uh, rather quickly, but feel free to, uh, to stop me if you like, or, or we'll spend as much time as you like uh, at the end with questions. Uh, I do want to also begin by thanking uh, members of uh, our focus group working committee who, who were invaluable in bringing their perspectives. Those folks are uh, identified there at the bottom of page one of the policy, but um, we had representatives of Metro's legal department, of our mayor's office, uh, of course, of, of our public works department. Also, Councilman Sean Parker, who's also a member of the the uh, council committee traffic and parking uh, tom turner and chrissy cassidy with um, the downtown partnership as well as betsy williams who is is this com this uh, commission's representative as well as uh, a business owner downtown and lastly tim wilson representing the um, valet parking industry here in nashville so we appreciate uh, each and every one of them and their dedication to this and their participation uh, since october when when our committee convened um, I'll start by, by mentioning the scope of, of our work, which was uh, really limited to uh, clarifying the ballet fee policy. Um, we know that there are a number of other issues in the world of parking in Nashville. Some of those are being addressed now by, by other efforts, uh, I think one of which is, is on the agenda here right after this but also um, broader smart parking initiatives and so forth, which this, this commission has been briefed on uh, in recent meetings. Um, uh, and so those things are, are not lost to us. We know that there's work to do in other fronts, um, specifically with uh, some of our meter equipment modernization, um, modernization of our application processes and those types of things. But for this effort, we were really focused on uh, trying to make progress on um, the valet fee policy. Um, to, to help us do that, we look to our existing code. Code uh, already gives us a pretty good tool uh, in terms of, of helping us to determine how we are supposed to be um, charging for use of, of the curbside in this area for valets, and, and that is found 
in Metro Code 12.41.080C, which is uh, provided in, in the in the memo as well, and uh, reads the fee for a valet parking permit shall be fifty dollars plus revenue loss annually for each required metered space as measured by the hourly rate for each metered space. Um, and and so the fifty dollars has been pretty straightforward. We've been good at that part of it, but the revenue revenue lost annually is the part that uh, we felt like needed some definition, and that's what this memo and this process was intended to provide. And so that's that's really where we're focusing on is is trying to uh, trying to define the revenue loss annually component of the existing code. In this policy um, brief here um, that that you have available to you, there's really two aspects to it. One is the applicability uh, of such a proposal. I'll go over that in just a second. And then um, the, the fee formula, which um, uh, might be of, of more interest, but it is important to look at the applicability uh, component too. That begins on page two of the, uh, of the brief. And um, it's really summarized by kind of four figures where we look at some configurations on the road because not all valets are, are structured or operate the same way. And, and this commission is, has seen different um, configurations come in. Some of those uh, would be some of uh, for so, some of those the the new um, uh, fee proposal would be applicable. For others, it would not. And and, I'll, and, and it's probably more straightforward to know which are applicable. If, if you were to look at page uh, three, you have one of two configurations that we think uh, is not applicable. And at the bottom of, of page three, we have configuration three. And this is where um, a, a property might, for example, construct a, 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 a curb cut to do a pullout um, ballet area in an area that did not otherwise have on street parking. So this would be an example of when uh, we would say this would not our, our valet fee policy would not uh, be applicable because they, um, they, in, in a sense, created new curb space that was not there to begin with. So, if you go to the next page, there's there's kind of a a summarized checklist, as if you will, at the bottom of page four, telling you that that this um, policy would only be applicable if if all three conditions are met. First of all, the configuration meets one of the two that we just looked at that, that um, would would apply. Uh, also that we are within um, current metered zone areas. So if a new valet policy were to, to come up in, in, in some place outside of downtown or midtown where we are already metering, it would it would not apply. Lastly, it has to be on a street that we already have some meter activity going. And so all of those three things um, need to be met, we believe, in order to meet that intent of the code, which which specifies that we are collecting for revenue, uh, annual revenue that is lost. Otherwise, we would argue that you don't have revenue being lost if you don't meet these three um, uh, conditions. And the second part of this, the, uh, the fee calculation is shown on page five, uh, working with our steering committee. Um, they, they gave us some, some very good direction in terms of trying to um, tailor this perhaps to what other peer cities are doing. So we looked at a number of other cities and, and modified our calculation accordingly. It looks complicated. We, we, we don't think it's really as complicated as it looks perhaps. And so it, under this proposal, the, uh, the valet fee would be calculated, of course, by the $50 as specified in code. And then we calculate the, the lost parking revenue as follows. Um, if, if two spaces are being um, requested, then um, it would be 35% of the uh, maximum potential revenue of those two spaces. And, and you see that in, that in that first component of the equation there. Um, N is the number of spaces that are requested. T is the number, is the time period. Uh, of the metered, um, the metered time period that is being requested uh, and R has to do with the parking rate, uh, whether you're in, in the CBD uh, right downtown, the central business district or more in the midtown area where parking rates are slightly lower. Uh, both of those things are tied back to the current rates at the time. So as those change, those numbers could change as is the, um, the number of hours per week that this applies to. So if 
if the commission in the future decides to, to say our meters are going to run until 10 o'clock at night until six o'clock, then that, that T value would change as well. So the first two spaces are at 35% of the maximum potential revenue. The next two spaces, so if a, an applicant requests four ballet spaces, those second two would be charged at a, at a rate of 50% of uh, the, the maximum potential revenue. And then anything above that would be the full maximum potential revenue. So that's where you get the 35%, 50%, and the 100%. Again, the 100% only come into play if more than four spaces uh, are requested. Um, so uh, with that, we can run calculations on, um, on the, the total fee of the valet areas for any, any uh, applicant, applicant that we have. Um, and, and then there are some fee examples that are presented there just to give some sense of, of, of how you, an example of how you make the these calculations and then maybe give a sense of, of what the uh, the total fee would be on, on business owners. And that brings me perhaps to my final um, uh, the final component of this, which is that uh, in, in working with our focus group and in hearing um, some of the feedback that has come as, as we have uh, uh, rolled this out over the past uh, couple of weeks, um, there are uh, very significant concerns that, that we that we hear loud and clear having to do with uh, financial um, impacts on on business owners in in downtown and midtown areas where this would apply. And as we all know, uh, COVID is is hitting these businesses uh, very significantly financially, and, and and this is this is on top of that. And so, um, as we as we consider this, what what I, on behalf of our working committee, is, is requesting is that um, as you consider um, this policy or modifications to this policy, as you wish, you would also consider uh, a delay in its implementation for six months, and that this would go into effect uh, July 1 instead of January 1, as we do currently. Uh, and with that, I'll be glad to uh, entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. So let's do, let's ask some questions of Mr. Hammond, and then I'd like to take um, comments from uh, the audience, because I know we have people here who want to comment. So uh, commissioners, questions, please. Mr. Chair, I had my yes. hand up in WebEx. I wasn't sure if we were doing yes. this. Go ahead, please, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hammond, since this, obviously the, the impact here is going to be outsized in District 19 um, from a council standpoint, I guess, let me ask two questions. It, it wasn't, uh, if I'm reading through the document, um, you know, I see the recommendation. Would this, would this ultimately wind up, I mean, it talks about, uh, a new formula look like this could potentially require legislation that would update the appropriate section of the Metro code. Is that correct? Am I interpreting this? It doesn't necessarily read as proposed legislation. It reads as a policy, but would it actually require an update to the Metro code of laws to implement successfully? As it stands now, we don't think so. And we've worked with, okay. um, with, with our legal department to ensure that. And, and Teresa, if she's on the call, can certainly correct me there if I'm wrong. But as we've been working through one of our, our main objectives was to try and, and stay very much in line with existing code, uh, recognizing that we think it did need some, some definition and some clarification, but we did not want to stray too far from that. Uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of them is, is uh, as we began with, we think there may be more changes coming. And so we wanted to simplify this as much as possible. And, and this may be considered a, a stopgap until bigger changes come. We don't know when that is. And so we wanted to go ahead and move forward with this now. Uh, but, but we're trying to keep this uh, in not, not veering too far from existing code. No, I appreciate that. Now, I mean, I will say, I guess, two things. And um, I am glad that a year later we are um, having an opportunity to uh, revisit valet fee policy. I think this is going to be critically important. Um, it's been something that's 
been the subject of recent scrutiny of, of Metro policy overall. Uh, and yet I agree with what you, and it sounds like the focus group have discussed uh, a delay to implementation, I guess. Um, I think that's probably the nature of my next question it, it, it is, I think it's gonna be important to um, look at the list of existing permit holders, the, the kind of proposed valet zones and, and fees would be approached and really actually go out there and use the period of, um, of any delay to do some outreach. I think it would be um, advisable for public works staff and maybe, I don't know if the, the focus group had a chair or anything, but you know somebody who had been involved in the development of the policy, whether it's Betsy, because I know she's got um, some, uh, obviously some exposure to downtown, but I do think it would be important to get um, public works staff and maybe a focus group member in front of at a minimum, um, the CVC, uh, the Nashville Downtown Partnership, uh, and probably the district merchants, uh, if not the district board as a whole. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, very difficult to have this be considered a, an appropriate public policy if we don't get or uh, the public input to it. Now, if you all tell me that that happened as a part of the focus group process, yeah, fine, but I I will say I got a lot of correspondence since this agenda got published that suggests we might, we might do well to get some more um, both outbound communication about the how and why we arrived at this point, but also some inbound um, considerations of real world examples, um, you know, to make sure we've covered uh, all the scenarios. And then I think to your point critically, whether we phase this in or delay it, I do not think um, this commission would serve uh, the potentially impacted community of business owners well if we looked at it even resembling a January 1 implementation. So I think, Jeff, did I hear you say July 1 is kind of your target? Yes, yeah, so that's what's been discussed. We're certainly open open to that, but, but there was some um, thought that this commission may, you know, depending on what action you want to take today, may revisit this again, uh, you know, later in the spring, perhaps May, and make sure that, you know, financially things look like they're getting back on track and, and, um, and that we can report back and talk to, uh, you know, what outreach did we have in that time period um, and, and certainly could do that and, and look at it one more time before it goes into effect. But, but that, is, that is what has been discussed to this point. Mr. Chair, I'm I'm happy to have other um, commissioners potentially ask some questions here. I, I guess in thinking through all that with Mr. Hammond and what the correspondence and uh, conversations I've already had, um, I think I'd be reluctant to adopt something today with a delayed implementation. I think it makes more sense to defer, have some public conversation, and then maybe come back and look at what the implementation timeline is. So I think to Mr. Hammond's point, I might look to say, um, let's defer this to say our March meeting. Um, and then at that time, maybe after some serious public input, uh, look at what an implementation timeline might look like, uh, especially knowing that you know, Metro Council uh, starting tonight and tomorrow is um, in serious consideration of uh, the mayor's transportation plan, which I know this kind of um, is uh, kind of falls under both the parking management and curb management elements of that. So making sure that the mayor's office, um, I know they were involved obviously in, in helping craft this, but just making sure that all that, uh, that public input and coordination is done. So. I'm, I'm happy to make a motion to that effect, but I'm also, I, I think, Mr. Chair, I might wait to make the motion until we've had some more discussion. But my my preference would be to defer um, even approval of this, even with a delayed implementation, uh, so that we can get some more input first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. I'm, I'm always a big believer in getting input from the citizens at large before proceeding with a big policy step. Other commissioners, comments, questions for Mr. Hammond? I agree with uh, with Councilmember O'Connell. This is um, Commissioner Williams. 
And uh, at first, and, and I apologize too, because I lost connection with y'all for, <laughs> for a period of time. So I missed all of Jeff's presentation of the policy um, and finally got back on. I, I do want to thank Jeff for all the work he's put into this because he did put a considerable, considerable amount of time into it and was thoughtful and and of course, since the, this has become public, I've had conversations with uh, stakeholders who will absolutely be impacted by this. And so I'm in agreement with Council Member O'Connell that we do need to solicit some more um, input. Uh, I, everybody that I spoke with said, yes, they are in full agreement that this does need to be addressed, that the fees are way too low. But coming up and, and impacting places like the landmark Hermitage Hotel um, at, to, to the level that they are with this revised fee, I think is something that bears more scrutiny on our part. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Any other commissioners, please? Yes, sir. This is uh, Sergeant Boy, and one of the yes. things we have been. Um, wanted to know about is once a business has been assessed what the fee will be um, is there any kind of policy or anything in place for any type of appeal process uh, for that assessment okay. mr hammond um I, I don't I don't I'm not aware of any of any time in the past where we've had uh, an appeal process. I think that that would probably come back to this commission. Um, you know, for us, it's a matter of, of setting the policy and implementing that in the form of receiving those applications, doing our technical review that says, yes, we could have a valet spot here with hamper traffic or, or complicate things. Uh, significantly, and then and then um, you know collecting those fees, sending those invoices, and collecting those fees. Uh, it, you you I think would just be talking about an, an appeal of the fee itself, which hopefully you know if if we go through this process thoroughly enough, you know we can head off a lot of those questions at at this point. I guess there's always uh, a possibility that that would happen. And my thought is that we come back to this. Um, but uh, Diane Marshall might can correct me if we've ever had that case before. I'm not aware of one where that has been appealed in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I just had a, a couple of questions. I mean, overall, I, I'm really um, also want to thank Jeff and, and the whole group that worked on this. I think um, this is something we've been really focused on for <laughs> a year at least. And and um, I think this does really reflect the spirit of what we had been asking for in terms of clarification of the existing code. It seems to me to be pretty, um, you know, clearly uh, defined by the code or, you know, clearly explaining the code. Um, and I, I do want to make sure, I mean, I, I guess I would express my intent or hope that we can finalize something very similar to this um, in the in the near future. I certainly recognize that this is a really tough time um, for all of our downtown businesses and also um, would support a six month delay of the start. Um, I think in finalizing some some potential tweaks, I would be curious, um, like everyone else in getting feedback from um, impacted businesses and and kind of doing some, you know, looking at the the fees that would be assessed and making sure those calculations come up with numbers that seem reasonable. Um, certainly, fifty dollars seems unreasonable, so I think it's going to have to be something more than fifty dollars for a lot of our our businesses in the most congested areas. Um, but I also want to make sure the the ultimate fee does make sense. I did have one question. You mentioned you looked at some other cities, and I was curious if you could um, give us a bit more information about how you came up with these percentages and if how those compared to um, what other cities were doing. The thirty five percent for the first two, and um, uh, what was it fifty percent for the next? Yeah, one, one thing that we found that several cities that we looked at had in common was was their fee structure was more on a, a cost per space per hour, not totally unlike what we're proposing here, but a little different. So, for instance, our neighbor over in Memphis, 
they charge something like 38 cents um, per space per hour that that valet policy. And, and if we look at um, the um, the percentage of the total potential revenue that that represents, it's something like 25 percent of, of the total potential revenue. Um, other cities, um, Denver's at about 33, Austin's at about 35 percent. Atlanta does something even a little bit different where they charge a, a flat rate per foot of curve that you're using, plus plus a, about a 33 percent um, fee, uh, corresponding to their potential uh, maximum revenue. So this, this would land us, we think, somewhere in the middle, although I would point out that some of those have significantly higher stand application fees. Some of them charge, for instance, to anywhere from two hundred fifty to five hundred dollars just for signage. You know, for their for their um, uh, public works department to go out and, and sign those things. Those are all costs that we don't have that um, the, um, that this code does not call for. We could probably justify those if we continue to do more work and wanted to modify the code. Uh, to bring that more in alignment, but we feel like we're trying to, to do this to, to at least be in the in the ballpark of, of those um, those percentages. Um, uh, probably the most aggressive one we saw, was Ohio, which which charges a full hundred percent of of the maximum potential revenue anywhere. So, um, you know, it, it it really it really ranges pretty widely, uh, but but we feel like this puts us in pretty good company. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Um, yes. I just I want to echo the sentiments of the other commissioners, and I really appreciate that Mr. Hammond, um, all the work that you've done, obviously, but leading today with the recognition that uh, more outreach is necessary in the community. I think that's very thoughtful um, and much appreciated. Um, I did want to ask that as we move forward, is there a way for us to identify um, the different, le how many businesses are affected by the different levels, particularly the highest level that's noted in the example that you provided? Um, we certainly have that, and I could kind of um, perhaps look down through here. So you're asking how many would have more than four spaces. Something on the order of 12 to 15 of our approximately 50 uh, ballet, ballet areas. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank you. Any John, words. Uh, I also want to uh, thank Jeff for everything he's done, Mr. Hammonds, and for Mr. Betsy for serving on this. And I agree with Councilman, <clears throat> Council Member O'Connell about what we need to do. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, John, I have one other question. Yes. 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 Um, if if we um, if we targeted a July first start date with uh, with some final tweaks and discussion in March, which I thought was a good idea, what would be the process for the people who get their renewals January first, and for some of the other um, valets that are on our agenda today? Would they pay fifty dollars and then get an updated invoice, or how would that work if um, if it changed mid year? Yeah. Can you? Address that, Jeff. Please. Uh, 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 Nora, that's that's really um, where, where we think we would be is that we would go ahead and and um, you know reinstate the valets for the year 2021 under the fifty dollar uh, fee, with the understanding that, that you know that there would be another installment of that or wherever this commission lands, um, and, and we would come back with with a supplemental uh, invoice for the rest of that. That's our current thinking. We have not probably, probably thought all the way through it, but that's where we stand today. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay. Uh, before hearing from, I ask if, if it looks like we're gonna be deferring this, if folks who wanted to join in the conversation still want to have a conversation, one of the things I want to ask is how do we go about doing outreach that 
you know, one of the issues that's come up is a lot of the stakeholders who may be impacted uh, do not feel they've had the outreach yet. So how do we do that outreach between, say, now and March? And then again, let me just, you know, we started over a year ago a process of trying to improve this policy. And I appreciate, Mr. Hammond, your efforts and getting the team together uh, because trying to get to the valuation of the curbside and how to use it is uh, very important for managing the city and the traffic. And uh, we knew $50 was too low and uh, we need to try to find where that happy medium is on the price. But how do we do the outreach? Uh, Mr. O'Connor, you may have ideas because I know a lot of the businesses are in your area, um, but we need to do that. And would we want to structure one of our meetings around kind of a, a, a quorum, uh, having an open uh, quorum where we let people come speak. So I'm looking for thoughts, feedback, ideas on that, please. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to co-host with Public Works and maybe recommend that we reach out um, to specifically the Nashville Downtown Partnership um, the district and to CVC and see if those organizations plus any others. And I might invite Betsy to, if I'm, if I'm overlooking a, a you know, a critical institutional player here, um, either see if they want to do a joint meeting or if they've got, you know, regularly scheduled meetings, we ought to present at and do something with. Um, but I think at a minimum, involving those three organizations will be critical um, to the success of the overall program. Um, and I think I'm starting with, with that idea and maybe co-hosting one or two uh, public meetings on this uh, or agreeing to participate in their, you know, kind of first quarter meetings in some way uh, is probably the best step here. M Mr. Chairman, uh, we, could, we have, uh, could we just set a date for a public meeting? Uh, through the ballet policy group and 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 let us work through that process set a date probably have it at the Nashville downtown partnership office if they're willing to host us there and then uh, we just invite everyone to come offer their input we then take that maybe I'd like to see us do this sooner than later so that we have yeah. enough time and maybe set that in January but not make that part of a regular traffic and parking commission meeting right. that sounds like a good plan I mean I do like the comments that have been made that we revisit this in the spring. March seems to be a good point. That's halfway between now and July. So we can get the feedback from the public meetings back and any other comments we would get. So um, let me ask whoever had asked to join, you know, based on the way the conversation's going, it would appear to be that we're moving to delay implementation for another six months. Um, are there anyone that would like to make any comments in addition to what's been made so far? I don't want to shut any citizen out who has joined our meeting. Mr. Green, this is Rob yes. Robinson. I'm with the uh, Tennessee uh, and Nashville Hospitality Association. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate you all uh, pushing this off for six months. I, I do and completely agree with engaging folks. Uh, I think that's one of the things that, that came up over the last couple of days as folks were just kind of uh, a little bit in shock. Um, you all know Nashville's been hit really, really hard and this mm -hmm. this is a uh, kind of a tough uh, pill for our folks to swallow. I think if you would have you know, said this to us a year ago, folks probably would have not even blinked, uh, but we're in a different place and I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I know with, with Spirit and, and, and the downtown partnership and, and our members, we probably could pull together all all those folks that are engaged uh, and, and make certain that they're uh, part of the process and at least communicated with. All right, well, Mr. Mortensen, if you can help us to make sure that the stakeholders are involved, that would be very, very helpful. Most policies are always better implemented if the stakeholders have a voice. Yes, sir, appreciate so, it, sir. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak Mr. Chair, to that end, I know if we're following um, Betsy's suggestion, um, I'm happy to make sure that staff, and I know Betsy will have a lot of these contacts, but that 
Rob and others are are kind of included on that key stakeholders list. Right. Okay. Or if there's no one else would like to speak, Mr. O'Connor, would you like to make a motion? Yes, please. I would like to move that we defer consideration of this valley fee, valley fee policy proposal until our March meeting. Um, and as a part of that deferral, um, that we ensure that we meet with, uh, at a minimum, the key stakeholders that have been discussed today, although I'm happy to entrust that to uh, Betsy and others on the focus group to make sure that we do that. But I do, let me let me say it this way. The focus, I'm happy for the focus group to organize that, but I would like commissioners to be given notice of, of when that public meeting occurs, because I would like to attend if I can. But, but otherwise, that's my motion. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second to this motion? Commissioner Williams, I second. Okay, all right. So is there any further discussion of this motion? If not, I'll call for the roll. Miss Robbins. Aye. Miss Kern. Aye. Miss Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Miss Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Okay. The motion has been approved. We'll uh, revisit this issue in March. Thank you, uh, everyone, for your comments, participation. And, Jeff, thank you again for all your hard work on this. Very grateful. Very grateful. Okay. The next item is an adoption of interim regulations for curb loading zone management pilot, Mr. Haggerty of Metro Public Works. Good afternoon, Derek Hagerty, Nashville Public Works. Uh, bringing up an item that we have spoken about at last month's meeting. Uh, so just to refresh everyone's memory, uh, back in September, council approved ordinance 2020-380. Uh, this gave traffic and parking commission the ability to establish rules for a curb loading zone management programming program governing the use of certain designated curb loading zones and allowing it to set amounts of related fees, including fees to be charged to users thereof. So before you today for adoption, we have the rules uh, for this program. Now, as we discussed at our last meeting, the purpose of this pilot is really to help shape our rules going forward. However, we do need these rules to set fees. Uh, so what we're asking here is just an interim adoption of these rules uh, we would suggest for a 12-month period, at which point they'll be updated to reflect a uh, more thorough set of rules. So the rules before you here today uh, direct, address directly uh, the program rules included in the ordinance. So just to go through these quick, uh, Mention loading zone usage and permits. Uh, no permits are required as part of this program. Bookings do have to be done through the Core Driver mobile app. Fees, we are requesting a range of fees from 75 cents to $2.50 per 15 minute time interval. Uh, we are planning to start off with a $1 fee. However, we would like the leeway to move these uh, up or down throughout the pilot program so that we can assess their impact. Uh, the whole idea behind this program is really value-based pricing. As we just discussed, we know that our curb has a value. The question that we're trying to answer here is for our loading zones, what is that value? And through this program, we believe that the market can help direct us to an answer. Uh, continuing on, minimum curb loading space requirements. Because this program is aimed at commercial loading, we are setting the minimum requirement to be eight feet wide by 40 feet in length. This is two traditional parking spaces. Um, just to make a clear distinction that this is not meant to apply to residential parking, uh, food delivery pickup, items of that nature. Much more focused on commercial loading. Enhanced enforcement, uh, for the pilot, there's no dedicated enforcement for this program. 
Uh, the goal would, in the future, as this program grows, to increase enforcement, improve signage. Under this program, we would continue to use our modified R7-6 loading zone signs, which are the signs you currently see out in loading zones. Uh, and included under the sign would be a plaque with instructions on how to download the app. It's a simple text to download program. Finally, automated enforcement here. This program does not rely on automated enforcement. Our enforcement officers will use the Court Inspector mobile app to let them verify that zones have been booked, but there's no automated portion of this. Eligibility for use, um, really taken directly out of Metro code. Um, anyone who could previously have used a loading zone can still use these. The only requirement is that they do have the Core Driver mobile app, which is used to make bookings. Methods of payments, required fees. So we have two options here. Registered fleets are able to uh, join the program through a fleet manager portal, a website that gives them and all their drivers easier access to this site, shared card. Additionally, drivers not associated with the fleet account will have the option to pay via debit card, credit card, or prepaid card. Finally, performance measures. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the goal of this pilot is to determine whether this technology and time-based fees can improve the efficiency, safety, and coordination of curb space in downtown Nashville. Uh, and there you can also see a list of evaluation measures. So these are the rules that we're submitting to the commission today. And we have also included a map of the locations that we're looking at. Uh, just as a reminder, the area that we're focusing on is between Broadway and Union Street, First to Fifth Avenue. Uh, pretty small, nine square block area. We've identified six locations consisting of eight loading zones. These locations were selected for two reasons. Number one, there have been a high number of reported incidents at these areas. Our enforcement team gets called on a very consistent basis to these locations. Um, they've recognized that this is where our highest number of complaints are coming. This is where this program can do the most good. Additionally, all of these locations are public loading zones, which means a uh, fee is not paid by a private entity. Uh, now, we recognize that all this space is public, but there is some sense of ownership when that fee is paid. So we tried to minimize anyone feel, feeling like that was being taken away from them. Uh, the goal of this pilot program is to run from the beginning of February through the end of July. Um, before you are the rules, regulations, and the locations we're intending, on the line with me, I also have Donalisa Joaquin from CORD, and we're both available to answer any questions that the commissioners may have. Any questions? Mr. Chair, this is Councilmember O'Connell. I do have um, one question for Mr. Haggerty and for CORD, I suppose. Um, my understanding is if I look at the proposal that has reached Metro Council, um, that there will be some camera-based enforcement of this program. Are those cameras that will be involved in that, are those to be Metro-owned, third-party-owned? Is, um, is there sort of a, uh, a, a, a data policy plan for um, things collected through that camera program? Derek Hagerty, Public Works, thank you for the question. The cameras are not to be used for enforcement. They are part, they're to be used for evaluation. Um, essentially, the goal with those is prior to this program being installed, we will have cameras up at two to three locations to identify the typical use we see there, typical levels of compliance, uh, conflicts that exist, things of that nature. And then a follow-up camera survey uh, in the middle of the pilot program. So those are only temporary cameras. They'll be removed nightly to collect data just attached to signposts in the existing area. Um, as far as data collection, obviously those cameras, because they're temporary, will not be owned by Metro. Court has a subcontractor 
who will be placing the contracts and responsible for the data. They will own the recordings and they will keep that data for 90 days, but they will manually redact it. And that's what we will see. Um, Public Works, Cord, from that camera data, all that we'll actually be viewing is essentially an Excel spreadsheet uh, with a breakdown of the events taking place. I guess a follow-up then, um, is there, I'm trying to think how best to ask this, is there, a, is there a sample sort of view that you could capture, right? Like, um, I guess I'd, I'd still be, I know this is to evaluate the loading zone process, but I would be interested in just understanding kind of how much of the streetscape will be taken in, um, you know, et cetera. What, I mean, you know, I guess in some ways, if we are authorizing a third party who has then got a subcontractor to be capturing this stuff, even knowing that it's 90 days, I've got um, a handful of, of related questions from that, uh, you know, who has access to that data, who owns that data, et cetera. Derek Hagerty, Public Works. Uh, the goal with that legislation, it will be deferred at this upcoming council meeting to allow time for public comment. The subcontractors will be available at the next round of council meetings to answer any questions. Um, if you'd like to send us a list of questions, we can absolutely ensure that they have answers prior to those meetings. Perfect, thank you. Uh, any other comments? Is there a motion? I have one quick question. Yes, ask um, away, please. Uh, Derek, have you spoken to, are, spoken to any of the fleets that might be using these um, zones to see if they're able to load the app and um, if they'll have any issues with it? Derek Hagerty, Public Works. I'm actually gonna hand this over to Donalisa Joaquin with CORD to answer. Uh, however, this program has been used in other cities, recently launched in Omaha. Uh, Donalisa, you're gonna have to help me with the other one. And Aspen. Aspen, yeah, sorry. And it's coming to West Palm Beach in the near future. So fleets have already been, for those cities, we've reached out to a lot of fleets at those higher levels. I'll let Donna Lisa provide a little more information there. Sure. Hi, yeah. Ms. Kern, this is Donna Lisa Joaquin from CORD. Uh, as Derek mentioned, we have already done outreach or, and continue to do outreach in, in, Oma, in the city of Omaha and in Aspen. And Aspen in particular has a very similar program to what we are proposing in Nashville. And we have about 30 fleets signed up. Um, which includes both local uh, and international uh, fleets and our local and national fleets. And so a lot of the outreach that we will be doing before and during the pilot is to really make sure that they are able to, not only the drivers themselves get on the program, but also the fleet managers who may be paying for their drivers on behalf, on behalf of their drivers. And so it's, that is definitely an important part of this program is the outreach to make sure that they are able to use the program uh, and able to find space. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Is there a motion to approve or deny a motion? I'll make a motion to approve, uh, to approve. Commissioner Kern. All right, Ms. Kern has made a motion to approve. Is there a second, please? I'll second, although I do have discussion. Um, yes. So that, thank you, Mr. Chair. The, um, so the, the action here being asked of the uh, per the agenda is um, adoption of just this piece of the pilot, is that correct? Is that correct, Mr. Haggerty? Derek Haggerty, Public Works, that is correct. Uh, and the camera portion is completely separate of this. If council does choose not to adopt that resolution, we will be able to go forward with um, manual observation and performance measures. It just won't be as thorough. Got it. Okay, that's extremely helpful. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty. And uh, I, with that, I'm I'm perfectly satisfied uh, to move from a second to a yes vote. Thanks. Okay, we have a first and a second. Let me do the roll. Any further discussion? Okay, Miss Robbins. Aye. Miss Kern. 
Miss Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Miss Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Aye. All right, the motion has been approved. Any? Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Haggerty and others. All right. The next item on our agenda, Council Member Sledge, are you still with us? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items from Council Member Sledge. Are you still with us, Mr. Sledge? I see Mr. Sledge on the call. I he see that he's muted. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see. Council Member Johnston, you have one item on the agenda. Are you still with us? Yes, sir. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. All right. Let's do your item while we wait for Mr. Sledge. Uh, okay. The item is an appeal staff denial to reduce the speed limit on Elysian Fields Road from 35 to 30 miles per hour. Okay. Miss Johnston, please. Let us welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you considering this. Um, so in District 26, our the, the biggest need that we have throughout the district is with traffic calming. Um, an overwhelming number of streets um, in all of my neighborhoods are cut through streets trying to avoid Harding or uh, Nolensville. Um, and so a couple of months ago, because I get these requests uh, repeatedly, I had requested that the speed limit be reduced on several of my streets. Um, and all of those were adopted um, without question, except for the reduction on Elysian Fields from 35 to 30. Um, Elysian Fields, I don't know if, it, if you all are very familiar with it, um, but it's a cut through from Trousdale to Nolensville Road. And so people use it to avoid Harding. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty narrow street. Um, the homes that are on uh, that road are, are decently close to that street. And so those families have expressed a lot of fear in allowing their kids to play in the street. Um, there is a sidewalk on a very small portion of it, um, but certainly not the rest of it. And, and where there is not a sidewalk, there's really no shoulder either. Um, and we do have Croft Middle School um, that's there. I personally have driven it several times um, in, in different parts of the day just to sort of gauge the difference between 30 miles per hour and 35 miles per hour, I'm actually paying attention <laughs> to it. Um, and I personally think that 35 miles an hour is is just is just a little bit too fast. Um, there's always a lot of pedestrians. We've got people that are pushing strollers, they're running, they're walking their dogs. Um, there's lots of kids. Um, I brought this up at a, um, at a recent neighborhood meeting and before I could even get it out of my mouth, everyone overwhelmingly said, yes, please, yes, please. So um, I know that this isn't, isn't going to be an end-all solution, um, but I do think that it would help. And even if it slows people down just a couple of miles an hour, um, it could be the difference between a really tragic accident or an accident at all. Um, so from a fiscal perspective also, because I'm always keeping that in mind, um, it was brought to my attention that there's no speed limit signs on this street um, outside of the school zone. Um, and so I actually drove it to count to, to make sure there is one. Um, but from a fiscal perspective, it's not like we're going to be in, you know, taking down perfectly good signs to replace them um, just to reduce it five miles an hour. We have to put some signs up anyway. So I thought it was a perfect opportunity to go ahead and lower that speed limit. Um, in an effort to slow people down. Um, all that being said, uh, in combination with the neighborhood's overwhelming desire and my wish, I would um, hope that hope for and ask for your support. Okay. Thank you, Council. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Hammond, what's the definition of this street? Is it a collector or residential? What's its definition, please? section of Elysian Fields is a collector, so it would not, uh, the uh, the upcoming countywide speed limit change would not apply to this one. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Knopf, do you have any other comments about this request, please? Yes, sir. And, and the council person's uh, statements were very accurate. Numerous driveways along this road. Um, but I do want to take this opportunity to show you this new and improved speed limit 
uh, reduction or speed limit setting tool we have, the Federal Highway Administration has what they call U.S. limits. And this is a very busy document in front of you. But, it, but what, what I want you to hear is we take into consideration the 85th percentile speed. You've heard us say that over the years. But this tool takes into account crash history, the classification of the road, as you just asked about, Mr. Chair, the number of driveways, et cetera, et cetera. And it has all these fancy formulas. If you want to see those, they're at the bottom of the sheet for the crash rates. But it, it takes all this information and recommends the speed, the speed limit. So long story short, you can see on the lower right up there, it's the 85th percentile speed. Um, we calculated that or we gunned that at 38 miles per hour. Um, the 50th percentile you see is 33. And when you put all this into this federal highway document, it comes out that the recommended speed limit is 35. We being data driven and engineers and, um, you know, we go by the book a lot. <laughs> and so that's why we requested that the council lady appeal this. Um, we didn't want to just lower the speed limit because of this technical information where she has provided additional testimony, as you just heard. Okay. So we're recommending it stay at 35, but, but you've heard her testimony at this okay. point. All right. It says here, uh, Mr. Knopf, that the pedestrian bicyclist activity is high on this. Is it, it from is your a, data collection? Right. The, and, it, and she's correct about the sidewalk, and it runs along the zoo, and it is a, a, it is a walkable area. Um, and it is uh, frequently um, used by cyclists. Okay, all right. Well, I'm very familiar with this street. I know it's still residential, but it also it has the back of the zoo and it has the school um, on it as well. And I don't know any kind of traffic calming things that could be done. Like you've been doing a lot of painting of cross kind of cross hatching to indicate lower speeds at some places, and would the Lower speed limit be painted on the street. That's been our usual uh, approach to make it more visible. Um, right now, that's not part of what we're considering, but we don't okay. take it off the table. We consider right. numerous things, but going back to what she said in, uh, when she was speaking, we will definitely make sure there's speed limit signs no matter what this decision is. Okay, all right, thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Is there a motion? Uh, O'Connell will make a motion to support the council member. Okay, we have a first. Is there a second? I'll second, Commissioner Kern. Commissioner Kern, is there any further discussion? The only thing I'll say, Mr. Chair, is I have both driven uh, and actually tried to ride my bike on Elysian Fields, and um, I understand fully why Council Member Johnston's constituents uh, are clamoring for a speed reduction here. So I'm Yes. I'm personally very content to support this. And I'm uh, guilty as charged as being one of the many who cut through many of Council Member Johnson's street to avoid traffic on Harding and Nolensville. So, um, yes, so we have a first and a second. I'm going to call the roll. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Ms. Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Hey, the uh, motion is passed. Congratulations, Council Member. You have a lower speed limit. Thank you all so much. You are welcome. Council Member Sledge, are you back with us? I am, yes. I apologize for that. No, that's um, okay. We took care <laughs> I didn't, of a uh, I, I Council do, Member. I come, I come bearing good news, however. I know that item... A, I think, is coming up, and it's actually the only one I would request the commission consider today. So just okay. So um, let let's dispose. So you would like item B, C, D, E, F, and G deferred for another time? Is that correct, Council Member? That's correct, Commissioners. Okay. It was a backlog, and and I'm working through those with okay. residents. All right. That being said, is there a motion to defer item B through? G, please. So moved, Commissioner Woods. Ms. Woods, is there a second? Seconds from O'Connell. Okay, let me do the roll. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Ms. Williams. Aye. 
Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. All right, thank you. So those items have been deferred. Council Member Sled, you did bring gifts of good news for <laughs> us. So proceed with item A, Mildred Shoot Lane and Third Avenue South, uh, the appeal staff denial for an always stop. That, thank you, Chair and Commissioners, for your consideration of this. You, you'll remember a while back you could, uh, you took up uh, an always stop appeal, which you granted at second in Mildred Shoot. And I can tell you, um, the actions of the this commission were quite literally life-saving when you did that. Um, we were having multiple uh, accidents occur, multiple side swipes and wrecks occur, cars into houses. That has all ceased at 2nd and Mildred Chute. Okay. Um, one block over at 3rd and Mildred Chute, you are seeing, and you can actually see on this intersection, um, that this uh, intersection is becoming denser and more developed. That that parcel you see there that is uh, a blank slate essentially right there in the southwest corner um, that is a multifamily development that was approved six years ago rebar and utilities are out of the ground at this point concrete slab is poured all all of it is occurring um, and so you're going to see about a hundred units go in there Across the street on the southeast corner, there has been commercial development, including a lot of folks who wrote in to you and to Chip, and apologies to Chip's uh, inbox, um, who, who attend uh, what used to be 12 South Yoga, which has moved over and become Chestnut Hill Yoga. All that to say you have a lot of people who have come in from within the area and outside the area who are interacting with this intersection. Right now, it has an east-west stop with a cross-traffic does not stop sign. Um, it probably should have a sign that says cross-traffic does not stop and it speeds and it does not care about you um, because that is what is occurring on 3rd Avenue South. Um, there have been problems with drag racing that we're working on with police, but the really bigger problem is one we find at a lot of intersections. There is confusion as to whether there is a four-way stop here to begin with. You've seen in some of those emails that residents have noted that there's a lot of stop start among people that's creating dangerous uh, avenues. And what I will say is part of our conversation, the reason I brought up second and Mildred shoot is part of our conversation was a concern that it would move traffic over to some of these other streets. Um, that has not, from what I've talked to residents, that has not anecdotally occurred as much. What has occurred, however, is what I've just indicated. I wanna reassure commissioners that if you are to grant this always stop, there's nowhere else for people to go. Fourth is one way going south, and one is First Avenue South is significantly narrower than Second and Third, and has uh, on-street parking on both sides and a school. It is it is not a a, a speeding issue um, like it is Second and Third. So all that to say, that's that's my explanation. I'd ask that the commission um, grant this uh, appeal. Hi, Mr. Knopf, you have any other comments? Yes, this is Chip Knopf. Um, Mr. Hagerty is going to do our presentation on this one, if you don't mind. Hey. Derek Hagerty, Public Works. Uh, so we took a look at this intersection using the guidelines laid out in the manual on uniform traffic control devices. Um, I'm sure most of the commission is aware, but Nashville Code Chapter 12.12.040 um, requires that all signs and signals, so far as practical, be uniform as to type and location throughout the metropolitan government area. Um, this is the document specified in there that all traffic control signs, signals, and devices shall conform to. Uh, so before you hear, you just see a quick rundown of the intersection, 3rd Avenue South, Mildred Chute Lane, both classified as local streets, two lanes, posted speed limits of 30 miles an hour. Uh, when we look at warrants for always stops, we're really looking at two things. The first is the eight hour average volumes. Stop signs are primarily meant for volume control. Uh, so what we're looking here for on the major street is 300 vehicles per hour uh, over an eight hour stretch does not have to be consecutive. And a minor street volume, this includes vehicles, pedestrians and bicycles of 200 per hour. Now, most of the data we've been using recently is pre-COVID, if we have it on hand. That just typically gives us the higher volume levels. Uh, so we are supplementing that with 
manual counts throughout the day by our staff here. Um, pretty low volumes through this intersection. Third Avenue South, um, have a study back from June 2019, highest hour there, about 85 vehicles. Mildred Chute, back from May 2019, highest hour volume, 92. A manual count conducted 28 October confirms that we're pretty well below these thresholds. Uh, so Warrant 1A is not satisfied. Warrant 1B is similar, but it lowers those volume levels if the 85th percentile speed is over 40 miles an hour. Um, out here, we have a speed study also from 2019, 85th percentile speed, 28.5 miles an hour. Warrant 1B, not applicable. Uh, finally, we move to Warrant 2, which is the crash history. Uh, here it asks, asks us to look for five correctable crashes which we typically take to be angle crashes in a 12 month period. This intersection has had a total of three angle crashes over the past three years. So warrant two is not satisfied. Um, so with that, stop warrants are not met. We do not recommend us and always stop at this location. Thank you. Any comments, questions from anyone? Mr. Chair, I, I move to support Council Member Sledge's stop sign. Okay, we have a motion to approve Mr. <laughs> Sledge's request. Come on, Mr. Wood, second. All right, we have a first and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay, all right. If not, we'll let me do the roll. Miss Robbins. Aye. Miss Kern. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Ms. Mr. Brown. Ms. Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Aye. Okay. The motion passes. Council Member Sledge, congratulations. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate your work. Thank you. All right. Council Member Parker, are you still with us? Yes, this is Council Member Parker. All right, welcome to our meeting. You have the next two items. Uh, authorize residential parking by permit on Hancock Street from number 300 to 337 and authorize residential permit parking on Arrington Street requested by a resident. You have the floor, Ms. The council member. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, again, this is this is Sean Parker. Um, this area of McFerrin Park has seen a lot of um, tremendous growth uh, and investment. Um, however, some of the uh, being within the UZO, a lot of the businesses have uh, that have that have come to this area have um, very low parking requirements. So. There's been a lot of tension between um, some of these wonderful new businesses that have opened up um, and long-term residents who are finding uh, that they no longer have space to park in front of their homes. Um, so this has been discussed for months, uh, probably over a year now. Um, but as of, I guess it was about six or eight weeks ago, residents on Hancock and Arrington began collecting petition signatures um, in order to request this resident only parking um, on these two blocks of uh, Hancock and Arrington. And um, I, they, I think, is Diane Marshall with us? If Diane could, if you're with us, if yes, Diane Marshall could speak to the. Um, yeah. Wonderful, uh, wonderful. Could you speak to the. For both of these? Hey, Ms. Marshall, you have the yes. floor, please. Okay, I reviewed the petition forms for both of these requests. Hancock Street meets the 75% rationale for approval of residential permit parking, and it meets all the requirements. The only minor issue I have on area 10 is I've got 74% and it says 75%. But if the commission is willing to Except that then staff recommendation is to approve both of these for residential permit parking. Uh, Ms. Costonis. <laughs> I 
Yes, sir. Um, I believe the 75% is actually specified in the Metro code. So I don't believe that the, um, the commission would have authority to deviate from that. Okay. That's what I wanted to ask. Thank you for keeping okay. us legal. Okay, this is Diane again. If the commission wants to defer action on the Arrington and give us one more month to perhaps get additional signatures, then we can bring that one back in January. All right. Count Councilmember Parker, can you work with that, please, sir? Um, Commissioner Green, yes, that would that would work for us. So we'll we'll do a little more outreach on Arrington Street there, and we're happy to come back and see you on January. Okay. Because we want to stay legal, please. Um, okay. Is any other comment from commissioners? Is there a motion to approve the the permit on Hancock Street, please? Commissioner Wood. So moved. Okay. We have a first. Is there a second? O'Connell seconds. O'Connell second. Any further discussion? Okay. All right. I'm going to do the roll. Miss Robbins. Aye. Miss Kern. Aye. Miss Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Okay. Miss Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. 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 Okay. Council member, your permit parking for Hancock Street has been deferred. I think I need, we need a motion to defer item K for Arrington Street, please. Move to the move. chair. Okay. We have a, have a move and a second. I will call the roll. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Okay. Miss Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. And Officer Loy. Aye. Okay. Thank you. So, Council Member Parker, we'll look forward to seeing you in January. Chair, um, was if I may, if I may, was the action on Hancock to defer or to approve? Well, it was approved. Arrington was deferred because it doesn't meet the criteria of 75%. Thank you, Chair. We'll see you in January. We'll see you in January. Thank you. Okay. The next item is to authorize a valet zone on Children's Way for 1601 21st Avenue South requested by Parking Management Company. One time council member, is council member Cash still with us? Okay. All right, Ms. Marshall, can you give us some background on this one, please? Okay, the valet zone is going to be located on Children's Way. It's for three spaces. The hours will be 10 a.m. to midnight, and this is three parking spaces. Okay, and my understanding is this is a former restaurant that's going to be a restaurant again. Is that correct? That is correct. It's going to be a barbecue restaurant. Okay, all right. Any other comments? Mr. Chair, does this, um, does this remove metered spaces? This is metered spaces. Okay. That was my understanding. So, Mr. Hammond, how does how would this request be approved if we were going to approve it in light of the policy that we discussed earlier today? That even though we're going to defer, you know, wait to implement. Uh, uh, Chair, I believe you would approve it the same way you had the, the previous ones. It's just a matter of what fee will be applied. And so if, if you did approve this, they would have the $50 fee in January with more to come, as we said with the other, um, all the other valet zones. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chair, let me follow up then and ask this, because I, 
I I feel like knowing that we are going to be removing metered parking, I guess I'm not sure if this is for Mr. Hammond or for legal potentially. If we issued, I guess, one of two things, if, if we issued a permit today, we know it would just be $50 um, with no revenue recovery for the loss meters. But we also know that this is three spaces and we're removing meters. Um, if we went forward with a new policy and knew that the applicant was going to just pay $50 right now and we adopted the new policy, then in calendar year 2022, when they came back to renew their permit, uh, would, would we actually apply the formula that included the lost revenue knowing that they had uh, removed meters in order to get this valet? That's an excellent question. A question, please. Yes, Miss Woods. Has the restaurant opened? This is JT Maynard with Parking Management. Um, no, ma'am, they have not. They are trying to shoot for a February 1st open. Okay. So would it be something we could defer? I mean, if the restaurant's not open, I, I guess I'm wondering why we would need to do this right now. Uh, we don't necessarily have to. Yes, we could defer to January. I think we just wanted to get it on the docket because sometimes it gets pushed to the following month if it doesn't get seen. Okay. I, I guess, Mr. Chair, can we also get, I appreciate uh, Commissioner Woods. Can we make sure we get an answer to my question about how this would apply? Yes. Mr. Um, Hammond, can you address Council Member O'Connell's question, please? Um, it, it may be something we need to look into further. Um, since this is a new application that would come right here, kind of in this transition period. But, but I do think that we, we as staff, certainly could make the applicant known. Uh, it sounds like the applicant may be aware that the, the, the change is coming and that they would be subject to the change if it goes into effect in calendar year 2021. Right. I think what I'm asking though is this would be different than a. There, there is a distinction we are opening, I think, between valet stands uh, created where there is no uh, removal of metered spaces versus those that have them. And I just would want to make sure that even if there is kind of this, you know, grace year of 2021 before the policy actually gets approved that, you know, if we are documenting removal of spaces throughout that year, uh, where we would otherwise be subject to loss of revenue that we can eventually reclaim it. And I want to make sure, um, I guess, with legal that uh, we could apply a formula here knowing that we have a policy in hand. And, and it, you know, if not, I would say this ought to be a temporary. Ms. Costones, can you address this issue, please? Um, with this particular specific example, um, knowing that the commission may adopt um, this um, policy as soon as March and that the restaurant won't open until February, I think Commissioner Wood's suggestion might be a good one that you could grant it um, uh, later in or early in 2021 and, and then maybe um, have it be a temporary until March, in, in which case the um, uh, the policy and the, the official granting of the valet zone would, would be contemporaneous and so that you could um, apply it immediately. Um, uh, with regard to the more general question, um, I, I did have that same question and, and um, Mr. Hammond and I did talk about it. Um, so the permit would renew annually. Um, and um, if the street is a um, within a parking meter zone area, um, and um, Public Works would always have the option um, not to renew the permit and to place meters um, in those spaces instead. Um, and um, uh, given that option or opportunity, um, uh, if the um, applicant wishes to 
continue to use the space for valet parking, and I believe they would have to compensate the department for foregoing or compensate Metro for it foregoing that opportunity to replace meters spaces meters on those spaces. Okay, I, I think that satisfies my question. Thank you. Um, in which case, though, I, I do agree with Commissioner Woods. I think for now, a, a defer and a temporary makes the most sense to me, given where we are. Okay. okay. Is there a motion to defer? Uh, Commissioner Woods, I move to defer. All right, Commissioner Woods. seconds. And Commissioner O'Connell has seconded. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Let me call the roll. Ms. Robbins. Aye. Ms. Kern. Aye. Ms. Woods. Aye. Mr. Brown. Ms. Williams. Aye. Mr. O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Aye. This item has been deferred. Okay. The Next item on our agenda is item M, authorize a loading zone at 301 to Mumbrian Street requested by Encore, which I guess is a new hotel. Is that correct? This is a business that is already established and they were operating with a loading zone. They did not renew their permit, but now they've come back to us requesting their permit be renewed, renewed for another year at this location. Okay, the Encore, that's, is that the apartments? That is correct. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Council Member O'Connell, this is in your district. Mr. Chair, I guess my only question of staff is, was there a reason this was not on the consent agenda? Staff, Ms. Marshall? I do not know why it was not put on consent agenda. Okay. All right. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Okay. We have a first. Is there a second? I second Commissioner Williams. All right, Commissioner Williams. Okay, we have a first and a second. Let me call the roll. Commissioner Robbins. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown, Mr. Williams, aye. Mr. O'Connell, aye. And Commissioner Loy, aye. Okay, this motion has been approved. Okay, Council Member Rosenberg, are you still with us? I sure am, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you for hanging in with us. Um, uh, you have a request to implement no trucks over 31,500 pounds on the following roadways, McCrory Lane, Poplar Creek Road, and Old Harding Pike from Highway 70 to Highway 100. Council Member Rosenberg, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, for the opportunity. Um, so this is regarding heavy truck traffic on some country road um, that are heavy with residences, McCrory, Poplar Creek, and a segment of Old Harding Pike. Uh, the goal is twofold. One, to deal with some unnecessarily uh, unnecessary through traffic uh, that's disturbing neighbors and has also led to some dangerous situations, um, in including a truck running into a house and, and number two to deal with heavy traffic for unpermitted projects that we currently lack in an enforcement mechanism to address um so on the map that's up on the screen there um of course in yellow are the roads where, where we're looking to uh restrict traffic and for every one of those there is a state or u.s highway or interstate that provides the same access for through traffic um, there's Old Hickory Boulevard, there's uh, Highway 70, which is called 24 on there. There's Highway 70 South, which is labeled as one. And then there's Highway 100. Um, so what's on the agenda, um, on, your, uh, on your agenda is an outright ban on trucks on these roads. And I don't think that's appropriate. And it appears that Public Works agrees. Instead, what I'm asking you to approve is a ban on heavy truck traffic 
besides those that are traveling for the purpose of the occasional delivery and pickup of materials and merchandise at residences and businesses, and for the occasion, uh, and to also allow those uh, who are doing the occasional delivery of building materials for buildings under construction for which a building permit has been issued. So normal traffic that happens locally, uh, one-offs, whether it's UPS or delivering building supplies for a, a permitted project would remain allowed. It is these other instances of heavy truck traffic. Um, these are narrow, often windy roads um, it'll enhance the quality of life for our constituents there uh, without making travel cumbersome for, th with, for through trucks uh, and, and also will not interfere with commerce occurring for nearby homes and businesses. So I'd appreciate your approval and I'm open to any questions. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, staff, who from the staff is going to comment? So I, I sent you guys... Um some reports that Mr. Hagerty did, and Mr. Hagerty is going to speak to this. Um, we have numerous people on the line though that can answer questions, but if you receive those reports, Mr. Hagerty is going to go over those for us. Okay. Mr. Hagerty? Eric Hagerty, Public Works. Uh, yes, I believe all commission members have the reports. We essentially analyze these streets uh, for a few different conditions. One, pavement condition and cross section. Two, street classification. Three, local state and regulations. And four, crash history. Uh, we also did have some concerns about the language being used. Uh, and this may be a question for Ms. Costonis to address before we actually get into the engineering analysis, but, uh, you know what defines occasionally and whether the Traffic and Parking Commission is able to use that language when applying it to a truck restriction. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I know, um, Mr. Hegarty. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that there is a, a, a precedent in the code um, that would um, kind of easily lend itself to a analogous definition of the use of that term in this context. So I'll, I'll add to that, um, Ms. Castone, this is chipping off. Um, so when we're talking truck restrictions, you can restrict trucks in numerous ways. Weight limits is typically the way to do it. Um, or you can go by axles or new, any other way. But even with those restrictions, they are allowed to conduct business, similar to what Councilman Rosenberg is presenting here. Now, when we do outside pro prohibitions for trucks, that's based on weight limits and bridges that are going to fall or they're deteriorating. And so you'll hear us present things like truck restrictions versus truck prohibitions. This is a restriction where we're restricting cut through trucks, basically. Other trucks that are conducting business that are legally there through a permit or whatever Council Member Rosenberg mentioned, um, that will not be something that the police department will ticket because they have a right to be there to conduct business. This is not a prohibition outright. And I just wanna make that clear. The trucks will still be allowed as Councilman Rosenberg explained. So Mr. Knopf, can I clarify, this will be the, um just under the existing provisions of the Metro Code and, and not the mandatory referral of the legislation amending those provisions of the Metro Code. Correct. This is this is not the mandatory referral that that might be coming our way or might be going to council. This is a this is a typical truck restriction that we've seen usually two ton, I mean uh, eight tons here at our level, it's usually sixteen thousand pounds. But because of the type of trucks in, in this area, uh, this is unusual, 31.5, 31, 31,000 pounds, but um, it has the same bearing on the type of trucks and the type of business that can be conducted there. It prevents cut through trucks or trucks that are obviously over 31.5, but it doesn't prevent trucks from being there outright. 
that then your answer is correct um, that, that you get previously gave. Um, I, I was misunderstanding the reference to, to the word to mean um, an interpretation of proposed new language to be added to the text. Can I, can I jump in? I just, I, yes. Mr. Chair, I don't, and Mr. Knopf, I don't have any evidence that I received these reports. Check my sent emails and I'll pop them over there to you regardless. Um, okay, if other commissioners did, then fine. Um, I just, I, as we're having this discussion, I'd like to have the information in front of me. I didn't either. May I ask a question, uh, Mr. Chair, of um, Mr. Knopf or Ms. Castonos? Yes, Council Member. Thank you. Um, so one of the recent incidents that led to this was a, a project that was ongoing on a piece of land in the back of a property. Um, I believe Ms. Castonos is familiar with it, familiar with this, where we had dozens or hundreds of dump trucks a day going to uh, that site, and it was those dump trucks were, that project was not permitted. They had not pulled any local permits for this work. Um, that was one of the trucks that hit the, uh, hit a home and also led to some uh, disturbing confrontations in the neighborhood. Would the type of restriction that you're talking about, Mr. Knopf, uh, cover, you know, prohibit that sort of activity? That is where I'm going to lean on our Metro our Metro legal advisor. Uh, that's the tough part of this councilman. It's um, it, a lot of it ends up being interpretation. So it, it, I think what we're talking about Chip is um, 236 110 a um, and the language in it except that such vehicles may be operated thereon to actively deliver or pick up materials or merchandise and then only by entering such street at the intersection nearest the destination of the vehicle and proceeding thereon no further than the nearest intersection thereafter. Um, so that exception um, becomes um, a very broad one um, uh, in circumstances where um, a particular business is um, uh, actively receiving deliveries or pickups of materials and merchandise um, directly from that location. Um, the um, enactment of the load restrictions on that road would not prohibit that from continuing. Does that answer your question? So in the instance that you and I dealt with uh, several months ago, unless we put in, unless we modify this to specifically use the type of language about occasional deliveries, this would not have an impact. If the business is actually located on one of the streets that the load restriction is supposed to be implemented on, I think that's a correct statement. And if they receive the reason pickups. Correct. This would you would have to have business on these streets. You can't use these to go to get to your destination quicker. Can't be a cut through. If there's another route exactly. to get to your store or your business, you would have to use that route. But if you're taking a delivery to someone, of course, you got to be on that street. Sure. So th this still achieves the one goal of dealing with through trucks, but the second goal of dealing with excessive dumping onto a property uh challenging for this board for this commission um because we look at the as derek will present we look at the road conditions and, and are the roads capable of handling certain types of trucks and traffic from a capacity standpoint from a weight standpoint etc and and like terry just said like Ms. castonis just said the code prevents us to a degree from prohibiting vehicles from conducting business. Help me out, Ms. Castonis, if, if I'm interpreting that code correctly, that's what I hear. I believe you are. Like you said, it is intended to prohibit cut -throughs. Okay, that being the case, I think that it's probably more appropriate to deal with this through legislation. So if I could, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna ask that this be deferred. 
Oh, okay. Thank you, Councilman. I apologize for taking up y'all's time. No, no, it's a, this is a very helpful discussion to have. Thank you. So if we could have a motion to defer this item, please. Uh, Council Member Rosenberg, did you have a timeline in mind? Is one meeting appropriate? Uh, let's do February, please. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll move to defer for two meetings, Mr. Chair, Ms. O'Connell. We have a motion to defer. Is there a second, please? I'll second, Commissioner Kern. Commissioner Kern is seconded. Okay, any further discussion? Right. Just a point of order, I guess. Uh, yes. This is just a general comment, not on Councilmember Rosenberg's proposal. I will say, okay. I'm, you know, I've struggled a couple times over the course of the year where we've been told we've received materials, but clearly haven't. And I just, I don't know how we can better prepare commissioners to have these discussions. I would have felt honestly unprepared to vote on this today without having had the opportunity to review materials in advance. So I don't know if there's a, a better ensure that uh, commissioners do get appropriate materials, but this is something that I, I think is critical for this commission's yeah. work. All right. Thank you, uh, Commissioner O'Connell. Well, I'll have a discussion uh, offline with staff to work on our processes. You know, we can always be better. Okay. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> we have a first and a second. Let me call the roll. Uh, Commissioner Robbins. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. 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 Thank you. We have made a deferment. Okay, with apologies to Council Member. Brandon Taylor, item I, I'm sorry I overlooked that. And are you still with us? This is an appeal for staff denial of an always stop at Chain Street and Arthur Avenue. Council member? Hey, Commissioner Green. Sorry, I uh, skipped your item. Yeah. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you, Mr. Green. All right, you have the floor, council member. Thank you. Yeah, so um, Arthur Avenue and Jane Street, uh, in, in that area, we've uh, been working really hard uh, to kind of slow traffic. We've added some bike lanes um, and we've narrowed the street, but uh, we, we've been able to find a way to speed up traffic with all of that. Um, and in the area, if you look at that Northwest corner, uh, that's a Elizabeth Park Community Center, and it's a senior citizen center there. And it's also Elizabeth Park um, there. So we have families uh, and folks that come out and um, play basketball and, and, and uh, enjoy the park um, right there at that street um, as families and, and uh, community center patrons uh, at the senior center there are coming across. We've added some crosswalks uh, but to also add a little extra safety there in this park area. Um, we also wanted to add a always stop. So currently right now, uh, east and west, we have a stop at Jane Street, um, uh, going east and west, and then we'd like to add an always stop going north and south on Arthur Avenue. Um, and so uh, Mr. Hagerty and I um, have kind of walked this uh, this area and see fit that uh, stop sign would best fit this area uh, to accommodate uh, those, especially there at the uh, at the park and the senior citizen community center. Mr. Haggerty, Derek Haggerty, Public Works, uh, Councilmember Taylor. I think you might have me confused with someone else on staff. Uh, I don't think I've had the chance to meet you in person yet. Oh, I'm so sorry. It wasn't Derek. <laughs> we have talked about a bit more, but anyhow, we've uh, we've had a, a, a staff member to come out. That was planning. I'm sorry. Okay, Mr. Haggerty. Derek Haggerty, Public Works. Hey. Um, Similar to the previous intersection we discussed, we also conducted a warrant analysis at this location. 
Arthur Avenue, Jane Street, both classified as local streets, two lanes each direction, posted speed limit 30 miles an hour. Uh, a 10 hour manual count was conducted earlier last week, mainly focused on Jane Street, the cross traffic and pedestrian traffic. Uh, criteria for the minor street, 200 vehicles, pedestrians, bicycles per hour. The highest hourly total we saw in that span was 64 vehicles from Jane Street. Uh, so that warrant is not satisfied. Warrant 1B only applies when the 85th percentile speed is over 40 miles an hour. Our most recent speed study at this location has the 85th percentile speed at 34 miles an hour. So this condition is not applicable. Warrant 2, crash history. Um, pulling the crash records, and I do want to caveat that our crash records are about three months behind MNPD's real-time records. So please know that going into this. There have been three angle crashes reported in the past three years, the last one being July 2019, prior to all those bike lane improvements, which considerably shorted that pedestrian crossing. Uh, so warrant two crash history is not satisfied. Additionally, we did uh, conduct a pedestrian survey in a 10 hour span, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. on a Tuesday, 16 pedestrians were counted crossing Arthur Avenue at that location. Um, due to the data presented, we do not recommend an all way stop at this location. Thank you. Um, any other com any comments from commissioners? I'll go ahead and move approval of Councilmember Taylor's request for a stop sign. All right, we have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second, Commissioner right. Woods. Commissioner Woods has seconded. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. See no further discussion, we'll call the roll. Commissioner Robbins. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Okay. The motion has been approved. Thank you, Council Member Taylor. Hope you think you're doing well. Thank you, Commissioner Green. All right. Okay. The next items are uh, deferred business items, uh, 24 hour uh, loading, a passenger loading zone at 1212 9th Avenue North, a valet zone at 310 Gay Street, and a valet zone at number one Music Square West. Council Member O'Connell, these are all in your district any update on these items um yeah on item a i'll just make a brief comment here the uh the project team did make contact with the residential neighborhood that that is adjacent to um and everybody agreed it's fine so i'm content for that one to get approved um i i guess i would let's go ahead and move that one independently of the other two just because these are valet on the same day that we're having a valet discussion so I'll, i'd like to move item a please okay there's a, a motion to approve item a is there a second second commissioner a second okay i'm going to call the roll commissioner robbins aye commissioner kern aye commissioner woods aye commissioner brown Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. Officer Loy. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, item A has been approved. Item B and C, a valet zone at 310 Gay Street and number one Music Square West. Council Hello. member? Yes. Hello? Okay, John. Okay. Both of these valets have been operating under a temporary permit. And that's why we're bringing them back today to see if the commission wants to continue the temporary permits in view of the fact that we're still working on the valet proposal. Right. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Ms. Marshall, uh, East Street Valet, well, I guess to Ms. Costanis's point, it doesn't really matter. 
I'm, it sounds like we will have the opportunity under the new policy to basically be cognizant of where the valley zones are and if they are parking. So it's not about whether there's a vested interest in the permit. So I, I, I'm personally at this point um, comfortable authorizing permits here, knowing that we will be reconsidering the overall valet program going forward. So um, I, I guess let me do it this way. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would move that we approve both items B and C for uh, valet. Okay. There's a motion to approve item B and C. Okay. Is there a second? Do I have a second? Well, Freddie, I just had, or Councilman O'Connor, I had a question. What was the difference between these two and the previous one we had um, in terms of your thinking? My thinking is these two are already up and running. Um, and uh, so I kind of followed Commissioner Woods' lead on that. All right. All right, I'll second. Um, okay. Yes, you. Okay, thank you. We have a first and a second. Let me call the roll. Commissioner Robbins. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Williams. Aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. And Officer Lloyd. Aye. Okay. Those are approved. Okay. We are almost at the end. The last item on our agenda is annual elections for chair and vice chair. Mr. Chair, this is Commissioner Woods. Yes. I'd like to uh, ask if the we could I could nominate John Green to be chair and fellow Brown to be vice chair during this time of, we're going through a hard time in Metro to see if you all do it another year for us. Uh, I, I am honored to be asked and I'll be glad to uh, continue to serve. I second that motion. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everyone. I appreciate your confidence in me. I mean, I'm assuming Commissioner Brown will accept his nomination as well. I assume that he will. <laughs> I think he's maybe technologically challenged, but uh, <laughs> not quite sure. That could be an asset. <laughs> well, that could be an asset in this day and time. Okay. All right. So we have a first and a second. Let me call the roll. Um, are there any other nominations? Okay, no other nominations. I'll call the roll. Commissioner Robbins. Aye. Commissioner Kern. Aye. Commissioner Woods. Aye. Thank you. Commissioner Brown. Commissioner Williams. A hearty aye. Commissioner O'Connell. Aye. And Com Officer Loy. Aye. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'll just say personal note of privilege here. It's you know, meetings like this, though they're long, that you really feel like you're making an impact on the community. We had a lot of good discussion today all over the county, and um, it is uh, an, uh, an honor to serve. So thank you all very, very much. So I hope everyone has a great holiday, and we'll see everyone in 2021. Let's hope 2021 is even better. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and congratulations. All right. Thank you, Officer Loy. Counting on you to make a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn, please. All right. All in favor? Voice vote. Aye. 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 Everyone. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.